so what I want to talk about is some work I've been doing on settlements, on still inhabited settlements. Um, and I'm talking about England. Um, and in this period, England is interesting because it is the period, the 16th century is supposed to be the beginning of the end of a long period of demographic stagnation after the Black Death. Um, and recent work that I've done has shown how excavation in the non-deserted settlements, the continuing settlements, uh, can reconstruct the impact of the collapse of the 14th century. Um, and I'm now, today, going to look and see what we might be able to think, of, uh, understand about the impact of the 16th century. So just to um, highlight this, you can see here, um, this is the population between about 1250 and 1500 from Bruce Campbell's recent book. And you can see how population levels in England are remaining low, um, whereas in Europe they're starting to recover earlier. Um, there's been a huge amount of debate about why the population doesn't recover earlier in England, uh, which I'm not going to go into now, um, but it is a recognised phenomenon. Um, and similar data, and this is quite old, but I think figures are still valid, are showing that when we get into the 16th century, we see a period of change um, across a whole range of different indicators, suggesting again that something is starting to happen in terms of um, uh, uh, recovery. Um, and when we look at other sorts of data, uh, we can see when we look before this period, this is 1377, the poll tax um, showing the approximate densities of population, uh, even given all the issues of using taxation data as a proxy for population, uh, it's all we have. Um, but what you can see is in the end of the 14th century, uh, the population densities are quite different to what we've got by about 1600. And the area I'm going to be looking at is eastern England here, where you can see there's quite a shift in the focus of population from broadly the north of the area um, to the south. Um, the data I'm going to be using is from around 2,000 one metre square excavations within these inhabited villages. They're all carried out using the same uh, methods, uh, following the same instructions, uh, recorded in a standardised manner and the results are overviewed each year in the uh, Medieval Settlement Research Group annual report. Um, and it, the work has focused, as I said, on the non-deserted site, the currently occupied rural settlements, rather than looking at the deserted sites, um, with the argument that they may be more typical than the deserted sites uh, most deserted villages in England seem to be uh, begin to be depopulated from the 14th century, though many of them carry on into the 15th and 16th century. Um, working in these inhabited villages, these currently occupied rural settlements, um, can tell you street by street which areas are uh, subject to intensive activity like habitation at different times. Um, and we can also use the pottery data as a proxy for population and wider demographic change. It's also a very effective way of involving uh, members of wider publics, and I must acknowledge probably about 10,000 people who've taken part in this project over the last 10 years. And if anyone is interested in doing something similar in Europe, I'd be very interested to hear from you, um, because I would like to see if something similar would work um, in other areas. When we look at the 16th century, um, we can see how this fits into a longer picture. The 16th century is essentially the beginning of the post-medieval period, um, and we can see the growth in this period um, is very, very strong in terms of the numbers of sites that appear to be inhabited, the numbers of locations within these settlements that are in, inhabited. We can see the growth is as strong, really, as it was in the high medieval period, is the drop um, after the 14th century and then this growth. And this is a map of all of the settlements that we've carried out these excavations in. So I'm going to take you quickly through um, a sample of these settlements to show how this evidence is demonstrating how the settlements changed um, over the period of the 16th century. And in some cases I'm going to go back to earlier periods so you can see 
how that change fits into uh, the wider change, so how unusual what is going on in the 16th century, uh, 17th century and 18th century is. Um, and as I say, they're all inhabited villages. This is Purton in Hertfordshire. For all of the maps, I'm going to show you um, a test kit that had no pottery of any given date is shown as a white square. A test kit which did have pottery in is shown as a circle. And the larger the circle, the more pottery. Correlating the data with field walking evidence suggests that for the medieval period, two sherds or more is more than you'd expect from field systems and might indicate settlement, whereas five sherds or more definitely or is very likely to indicate settlement. Please ignore the distinction between grey and black. That's for a different, um, uh, a different issue, which I won't go into now. So when we're looking at Purton, um, you can see this is the map of settlement today. And you can see in the 12th to 14th century, the dates at the top there, so that's um, before the Black Death, um, the settlement of the village is very, very densely inhabited, nearly all of the test pits producing large amounts of pottery. We can see then the impact of the Black Death when we look at the two centuries after the 14th century. And this isn't just the impact of the Black Death. There's a series of demographic, oh, there's a series of difficulties in the 14th century uh, which caused the population to fall. And I'm not going to go into that in detail now. But you can see what the village is like by about 1500. Um, very, very thinly populated with large numbers of pits producing no pottery at all. And then when we look at the couple of centuries from 1500 onwards, we can see the recovery. So we can see we've got the entire um, streets uh, across much of the settlement have come back into um, uh, intensive use, um, particular, uh, in particular the areas outlined in green here, the main high street, the area near the Mott and Bailey Castle, near the church, and this area um, down in the south of the village. We can also see other areas that are not really recovering. Um, the street on the edge of the settlement here, the north end of the settlement here, and uh, this area here. Now, those might look like the sort of recent margins of the settlement, but actually when you go back to the high medieval period, you can see that these are areas that were in, exist in intensive use in the uh, high medieval period. So we can see at Purton what changes are happening. We can also see, actually, when we look at the 19th century data, that really it's not until this period that Purton recovers to its pre-Black Death level. So here, the 16th century is the beginning of the recovery, but it's a long, slow recovery. So it's a brief summary there. Sorry the text is so big. The presentation I was in yesterday, the um, screens were terrible, so I raised all the font size, and it's much better here. Um, so just a few other examples. Sharnbrook, it's quite near um, uh, Purton. Um, it's a similar pattern, really. Uh, this is the uh, village uh, before the Black Death. Afterwards, not as badly affected. But we can see, again, in the uh, post-medieval period, we've got a sort of intense nucleation in this area. But we've also got extension into other outlying parts of the settlement. At Great Shelford... Um, we have um, uh, an Anglo-Saxon core of settlement down in the south here. We can see in the high medieval period, um, there's been a new settlement found. This is called High Green. So there's a new settlement up here. The settlement extends along the high street. It then contracts back. Um, again, drops very severely in the later medieval period, the latest medieval period. And we can see, again, dramatic growth here in the post-medieval period, the 16th to 18th century, focused on this area, and high green repopulated at this time. At Cottenham, um, we can see, again, we've got an Anglo-Saxon core here. The current church is right up in the north there, though we suspect there must be a church somewhere in the centre here in the Anglo-Saxon period. Um, in the high medieval, we see the settlement up near the church coming into existence. You can see the regular boundaries there, which might date to this period. Uh, we can see it's much more difficult to see the settlement here. Um, in the post black death period, we see this settlement here uh, producing absolutely nothing, and the central settlement here being uh, depopulated. 
And in the, from the 16th century, we see the settlement recovering very dynamically, uh, large um, amounts of habitation here. And this seems to be the period, really, when the settlement near the church is certainly coming into um, more intensive, more extensive um, habitation. The church is actually quite late, I think it's 14th century there, um, but the settlement clearly extends there, and it may be this is the date when these strips are laid out. Um, at Islam is on the edge of Fenland. Um, we see here, again, there's relatively little in the late Anglo-Saxon period. There's the single site there. Sorry to keep moving. I appreciate this is a nightmare to film this, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, we see in the high medieval period, there's an outline settlement here, um, which is depopulated. Um, the main settlement where the church is, is carrying on, not too badly affected. But we can see very dramatically in the post-medieval period, we see this intensification here, firmly nucleated settlement. This deserted settlement produces nothing at this date at all, nothing post-14th century. We also see in areas of dispersed settlement, new settlements being founded. Um, so this is Little Hallingbury, um, a much more dispersed landscape, as you can see, um, with a, a attenuated settlement, outline greens, um, when we look in the post-medieval period, uh, sorry, the late medieval period, we can see, this again is after the Black Death, um, there's a clustered nucleation near the church here, um, tiny amount of activity, these are just single sherds from each of these pits, these are much more likely to do, be to do with field use, uh, non-intensive use rather than settlement, but when we look in the uh, post-medieval period, the 16th to 18th century, we can see this clearly seems to be a period when this settlement is founded, this settlement grows, and there's another new area of habitation here and there and there. So we can see dispersed settlements forming in the landscape. It's an interesting, almost complete reversal of what appears to be going on in Czechoslovakia, which I didn't know. Um, sorry, in Czech public, but I didn't know before um, uh, hearing the papers this morning. At Garbelsham, um, we see... Um, Again, a very small, linear, rather scattered Anglo-Saxon settlement, growing a little bit. Some of these outlying dispersed uh, habitations coming to existence in the high medieval period, but nothing down here on the edge of the common. Um, you see, again, a severe contraction in the later medieval period, really virtually very little going on at all, uh, it would seem, in any of the sites here. And then when we get into the post-medieval period from the 16th century, we see again the, the intensive um, expansion here um, in the number of inhabited sites. This isn't just showing the volume of pottery. Uh, pottery use may well, we may be getting more pottery deposited, but it's showing the number of sites. I want to make the point as well, we've got activity coming in here. Um, similar at Hesset here. Uh, small Anglo-Saxon nucleation growth in the high medieval period with some out so just to go back to that with some outlying settlements here um, contraction and then these dispersed settlements out into this landscape which is heavily wooded um, these feel like clearance settlements or re-clearance settlements reoccupying these areas uh, similar in Manuden, we see again this is uh, just before the Black Death um, into the period after it and at all of these periods we've got really nothing turning up from any of these outlying sites, these greens and ends out on the edge until we get into the early post-medieval period and at Carlton Road other examples again uh, here we've got a dispersed settlement pattern in the high medieval period before the Black Death on the edge of what's a common here um, out uh, isolated farms, um, you can see from the scale, these are quite far apart. Um, but interestingly, there's actually nothing around the church. The parish church is actually just underneath there. Um, we see the depopulation after the Black Death, and then we see, again, very, very intensive use of the landscape. Nearly all of these sites in the 16th to 18th century uh, producing large amounts of pottery, and for the first time, we've actually got settlement around the church. And the church has been there since the 13th century, but isolated until we get into this later period.
At Nayland, we see a village that first appears, or a small town that first appears in the high medieval period. Um, it doesn't suffer really any setback or any, any visible setback that has a permanent impact um, in the post-Black Death period. Um, and what we see here in the 16th to 18th century is extension along these outlying streets. So we've got growth in this area. Um, now, there is a question here, of course, as to to what extent we can link any of this to the 16th century. And I've been using the term post-medieval, and I've been referring to 16th to 18th century. And that is a function of the dating of the pottery. Um, if only pottery use changed every century on the dot, the lives of all of us as archaeologists would be a lot easier. Um, it is difficult. Some of our um, indicative wares from this period have very long periods of use. We've got stoneware, and particularly the glazed red earthenwares. We actually find very little stoneware, um, strangely enough. Um, but we get a lot of glazed red earthenware, but it has a long period of use into the uh, post throughout the post-medieval period. We do have some other wares that have a tighter chronology. Um, and as you can see, they're not perfect for the 16th century, but they are better. So when we look at Nayland again, which is the one I've just shown you, um, we can start to drill down into the, uh, the wares that may actually be mostly 16th century, or at least certainly fit into the long 16th century. And the, the term long 16th century works very well from the pottery. You can see there's actually quite an interesting pattern here. There's clearly a concentration of these black circles here um, along this street, um, which is called New Lane. So I think we can be fairly confident that probably dates to some around about the 16th century and some outlying use here. But this whole area here produces no pottery of the 16th century date. Um, what we can also see is most of these sites are also, all of these sites are also producing this glazed red earthenware, this stuff that goes all across the period. But we can contrast that with the um, 17th and 18th century wares, um, which are quite um, easily datable. Um, and we can see that there's less emphasis on this area. And in fact, for some of these, there's really very little pottery turning up. Just single sherds from this period really is negligible in terms of settlement. But we have clearly got um, a, a new development, probably, of this street in the 17th and 18th century as the town is growing. It does raise the question, though, when we compare these distributions as to what's really going on in areas like this, where we're getting lots of the glazed red earthenwares, which we can't date very tightly and very widely used, but these more dateable wares, which are probably there's no such thing as high status pottery ceramicists telling me but uh, tell me but they're they're perhaps more special and these most of these dateable 17th and 18th century wares are imported from some distance away from Staffordshire or even from um, uh, other countries so it may be these are the higher status areas and the glazed red earthenware is giving us the um, the more um, the kind of less high status areas it may be to do with dating but what it is showing is how we can see developments in these periods in the 16th, 17th and 18th century in these settlements. Um, and there's another example, Ashwell. Here we've got the, the basic data. This is the uh, pre-Black Death, a bit of a, sort of this, but, well, it's a rather bitty settlement, really, not very densely inhabited. Uh, after the Black Death, it seems to uh, coalesce around the church. Um, and then into the post-medieval period, we see this coalescence around the church become much denser, larger, and new areas of settlement expanding there. And then we can look at this from, again, these uh, what's actually 16th century. We've only got three pits that have produced definite, dateable 16th century material. Um, and that contrasts with the 17th and 18th. So I'm just going to skip over this and show you the distributions across the whole region. So the bigger the circle, the higher the percentage of pits producing pottery. This is the before the Black Death. This is afterwards, which gives you a clear indication of the sort of level of contraction we've got after the 14th century. And this is the post-medieval, the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Um, and we can highlight those places that are where the, where the growth is greatest, where the percentage of pits 
uh, with pottery of Rhetis, and we can see this shift to the south that you can see in the wider uh, demographic, the historical data, and we can relate this then to the uh, farming regions, um, which I'm not going to go into now, but you can see, I think, generally the areas where it's sort of grain and stock, sheep and grain, the grain growing areas, which are the areas A and B, the unshaded areas, are growing less dynamically than those areas where there's more in the way of stock rearing and pastoralism. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.